Welcome to the Lost Signals Discusses Literature, where we apply the revolutionary mutt skill to classic and contemporary works of prose. So, join us once again, won't you? Hello there, welcome back to the Lost Signals Reviews Literature, and of course, as our tradition, we are going to do a horror-ish or horror-flavored story, if you will, for this year's um, season. I, of course, am your... Pagan God Scott Thurlow, and I'm here with Christopher Morgan. Good evening. And Steve Ramosi. Here to terrify and madden you. Indeed. It doesn't have to be Halloween, you do that anyways. <laughs> but yeah, so I think for this story, we're going to discuss The Great God Pan by Arthur Machen, which is an author, an author we discussed uh, previously. Uh, we did The White People, the story of his. So yeah, we decided to, at first we wanted to do one in the vein of that, but in my course of research, it seems like A, his stuff is easily available, and this is one of the ones that's like, quote unquote, a fan favorite from those who read him a lot. So I was like, let's just go with this one. So given all that, Chris, I believe you prepared a logline for this. Pan it all to hell. Exactly. <laughs> and oh, with yeah. that, Steve-O, tell us about the plot of The Great God Pan. All right. Well, uh, the story starts out with Dr. Raymond. What's his last name? I don't know. I think it's just Dr. Raymond. Dr. 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 Raymond. Dr. Raymond uh, convincing his friend... Uh, Mr. Clark to come over and witness a, a thing that he's going to do. A and great wondrous experiment. Yeah, basically he just does some brain surgery on this uh, woman, Mary, that he's met, that he kind of rescued from the streets, I guess. Yeah. Um, in order to open her mind to another dimension, seemingly. Things humans were not meant to see. Right, no. something like that. And Your she, 19th century Timothy Leary. Of course, she immediately goes mad. Um, you know, this is very in the in the vein of Lovecraft. If you're looking for like kind of I mean, an idea, of he precedes Lovecraft. Is, yes, exactly. But like you know, if you've read sure. any Lovecraft, you ca- you'll feel at home yeah. in 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 this story. So exactly. uh, she goes insane right away, and then um, the story kind of skips around. So each there's eight uh, chapters, and each one is kind of like a different time frame. They start to get closer together as the story goes on, but yeah. Um, as, as it progresses, you kind of, uh, meet these other characters, um, Villars and Austin, Austin being the two main ones, they, uh, come into some strange circumstances as well, where there's like, there's this, uh, woman who kind of has a strange, if they've heard stories of the strange effect that this woman has on people. And as we go through it, there are, you know, kind of these maddening things that are happening to people. Uh, people, people go, are going People mad, going crazy and so then come in. Yeah, like, so as you yeah. get towards the end of the story, people, these, like, well-to-do people who are really well off and, like, supposedly by every account very happy, just start committing suicide. Um, and as they delve deeper into the mystery you know as they're compelled to dive deeper in the right. mystery uh so they can't right. like kind of lay off even though they are warned to by uh, I, I believe clark yeah. tells villars not to dig into so they it all, so sorry real quickly they all like somehow know each other or, like encounter each other and yeah. clark has a piece of information and his experience with raymond and then villars and austin like are discussing weird happenings in and around london surrounding uh the woman you made. Yeah, I think it, I think it, I honestly, I, I like how all these it's almost like a Tarantino chapters thing. are almost their own stories, but they dovetail into each other mm-hmm. super well. Um, but you know, as, as it goes on, they are kind of like putting together information slowly and getting more and more information. And then as you get to the end, uh, Lars and Clark are going to go, uh, you know, find this woman, Mrs. Uh, Beaumont, who they realize is the same as uh, Helen Vaughn, who had caused a stir previously, and and a friend of theirs, to yeah, and so, someone else too that they also <laughs> exactly. So they heard of. they go uh, the 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 second last chapter leaves off. They go to confront her, and then in the last chapter, it's kind of a postscript yeah. where there are like letters uh, from the doctor and uh, some partial uh comments from clark about kind of what happened afterwards and it's basically 
they convinced her to hang herself in order to, I guess, save other people from going mad, and and that's kind also of also doing the same. That's kind of it. I mean, there's a lot more to it. Well, she shifts and morphs, and they're like, ah, oh, the horror. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot more to it that that gets a lot deeper, but that's sure. kind of like the basic outline of the story. And I love the way they did the, he did that too. He's like, well, I'm going to leave her with the because uh, he form uh, can't remember his name. I can't. Tr- uh, keep track of these names he he um made this hemp rope noose and he's basically like i'm gonna leave her in the room for 15 minutes yeah. it, i yeah, mean it, it it's delicious. just it's such a it's such a, a wonderfully insidious yet earnest there's there's a confluence of um of things that go into that whole scene where he's talking about it mm. and I, that i really appreciated yeah, I think I thought it was a, a really fascinating way to tell a story. Something that I haven't exactly seen, but is still fairly reminiscent of like the any of the Lovecraft that I've read. And and as you said, you know, Lovecraft was inspired by right. uh, Mitchin. So uh, I think it's I think it's a really cool story, and I think that it holds together pretty damn well as a plot. Uh, that being said, Scott, I know you have some other things that you might want to say about that. So. Um, I mean, yes, I enjoyed it overall uh, more than quite a bit, but if we're going to start talking about scores, I'm looking at a pretty strong two, just because a lot of it might go to style, where, like, I'm going to take points away here and, like, put a bit more into style when we get to it. But, like, yeah, certainly, like, as you know, and audience may familiar with, I'm a pretty big Lovecraft fan, and I knew, in fact, that Machin was one of his influences as he cited directly, and you can certainly see it, as you mentioned, like, mm. it's pretty closely... So, yeah, it's an interesting little thing. Like, it's almost like a detective tale, really, like a Poe like thing, even, like, as a bunch of characters come into some information and hear snippets and rumors around them and they start putting it all together and trying to figure it out. But I think it drags, like, a la, maybe not to the same degree, but a bit of Heart of Darkness, only in the sense that I think the narrative sometimes falls just, lulls just a little bit in various parts. Now, it's sort of. A nitpicky thing, but I think I noticed it just enough to dock just a point here. But that's my thoughts on it. But I can certainly see you giving it a strong three. Just me personally, it had a little bit of like, eh, this could have been tightened up. This could have been a little bit like, you know, more concise. But that's pretty much my major like issue with it. I agreed it's with not you. not even that major. I really agree with you until I got to the end and realized that because it was really hard when you're reading it the first time to keep all this shit in order because we are jumping around a lot and yeah. trying to figure everything and when you get to the when you get to the um uh uh the po- i guess the uh tag at the end of it um the epilogue so to speak um and all of a sudden everything kind of gels in mm-hmm. a way um that sure. makes me, that make no but, but then it, all of a sudden I'm like you know what I want to read this again knowing what I know I want to read this again so I'm torn between your thing where, well, if I want to see it again or read it again, you know, it'd, it'd score higher. But am I reading it again just because You can now... put that towards recommendation. That's my trick. That's what I do. Okay, I'll do that then. <laughs> and then I agree with you. I'll give you the strong two because it, I cannot really judge. I mean, it, to me, it did drag here and there. Um, but um, it, I liked it when we got to the epilogue and everything kind of gelled. So, yeah, I, it is something I'd probably read again. So right. Yeah, I was, I was pretty... I was pretty into it the whole way through, I think. I understand what you mean when you say it dragged. Uh, as I was mentioning, there were some like really long paragraphs Just at various points, in there. You know. But honestly, it 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 didn't you didn't feel it. It only much. bothered yeah. me very briefly and sure. I'm going to I'm going to I think I'm going to give it a 3. All right. It's it's really funny That's because solid. it was like each chapter had this obligatory like page long paragraph. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. But yeah, that's fine. Um we're pretty close on that. So anyways, I'll move along to themes. And again, your classic like cosmic be- th- things behind the veil of reality that you're not meant to see that myths are possibly real. Right. So the whole thing, it's called the Great God Pan. And a, a running motif or at least mentioned a number of times is that a satyr like image starts to drive people insane. And that the whole experiment at the beginning is to expose this young woman to whatever like lies beyond our perceptible reality which then of course she's touched by pan says touched by some kind of evil ish force mm. or in, no negative influencing force that uh, manifests itself in that image and then again you then you got the detective like part of it so you know trying to figure out like what's really going on which maybe go a bit to characters but i think that that theme is always going to be solid enough for me and i think it was well handled here 
like again, Machin is like one of the originators of this type of stuff that the, the quote unquote cosmic horror or right. like you know hidden hidden knowledge driving you mad kind of stuff, witnessing unnatural things that shouldn't exist but yet somehow still surviving them but possibly being driven insane by them at the same time. So all that stuff, like I think he you know. He kind of codified a lot of it, and I think it's it's really well handled here. So I really have no complaints on that front. Have you guys anything else specific in themes? Though? I, I was going to Go say, ahead. kind of like is, is the um, the bridge between gothic horror hmm. and yeah. and and like twentieth century yeah, like, like that, Lovecraft. Yeah. Um, I liked. I don't really have anything to add to your themes. I agree with you one hundred percent. I I think you and I are both suckers for this kind yeah. of th- I'm this kind of thing. For sure. Um, I, I, uh, I don't really have anything to add. Yeah. I thought that, uh, he did a great job, um, making the, making the horror of this, the theme of it, uh, you know, like making it so that you can't escape the, this like feeling of dread. I, I, I really love this type of yeah. writing. The for that always reason, there throughout. Even yeah, it's like they're not being confronted by horrors. Directly. Right, exactly. That, that's the whole thing. Is this? This is like one of those you don't really see the big bad, or you don't really see the big evil, uh, but it's like always there, weighing yeah. on the characters. It's ever and present. Yeah, yeah. It's so well done, uh, and you know, the, I guess that is the thing. Like this, it's this idea. The theme is like this idea of like should we pull back the veil like is is um our idea of like going after scientific knowledge or like knowledge of of whatever else there is worth it and that type of thing and you know things that were really um really at the forefront of this of this type of storytelling yeah. in the early 1900s and around that time um Oh, when did this come out? Do you know when this came I out? I think it was a bit before that. It might have been late 1800s. Late or 1800s, so. yeah. yeah like late. around that. But you had Sorry. like around that time you had um, the King in Yellow, which I think it was yeah right. Right. The King in Yellow, yeah, which came out around the same time I too. I believe they were contemporaries, if I recall correctly. And I read that a while ago, and that yeah, that story is great, and like feels has a similar feel to this. Uh, so it's it has that really interesting idea of like people being very trepidatious about what is coming what science will bring um and you know like it's done in a different way now but uh i feel like that's always kind of going to be there like what's on the horizon and like what horrors does that hold so i'm going to give it a pretty strong one for theme very nice chris as well officially one yeah i did i was actually um Looking up to see when Murray Shelley wrote Frankenstein because the the way he accesses the supernatural at the beginning it does is, have a very similar is through feel-ish. science yeah. Yeah. yeah and um and of course like I'm getting up all the bloody fucking movies but I just <laughs> wanted to just historically to to put into Mention where that. this came in yeah goddamn the internet um but so but, useless but go, no go but it, it, in a lot of you know because because. Shelley was it was more of a, a biochemical thing rather than you know what you saw in the um, sure. a, in the um, horrors you, beyond you, our reality yeah, the, or in, whatever in the movie that we covered last year for Matsuin and um, so it kind of really felt like it combined that with Lovecraft with a bit of Doyle yeah like I said like I, yeah. I like I didn't think of that but I think you're right there uh, I think uh, I mentioned Poe or Steve I mentioned Poe or both would be yeah. Precast, like you know, like I said, it's a bit of a detective story because the characters are figuring it out, and yes, they're confronted with some kind of like you know unnatural uh, enemy, if you will, mm-hmm. or like culprit, I guess we'll say. But yeah, I think we agree it's all pretty well handled, and uh, looks like we're all giving it a one. Any uh, any final thoughts on themes? No. All right, yeah. so let's move on. That'll be you, Chris, and tell us about the antagonists or antagonists of the Great God Pen. Oh, By that's... the way, Frankenstein was eighteen eighteen. 1818. Okay, so it did predate this. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, thought by so. a wide margin. I know. I thought so, but I just wanted to be sure. Shelley, uh, widely known as the inventor of sci fi. Yes. So. Um, so the antagonist. Well, the antagonist could very well be uh, Dr. Raymond because he was the one who set this. He's just doing it for science, speaking of. For science, <laughs> you monsters. You monster. Um, no, I mean, because, I mean, he did unwittingly. 
open up Pan, you know, Pandora's box. Pandora's Pandora's box. Pandora's box. Yes. Yeah, that would have been a good line too. But yeah, no, I get you. God, you know, <laughs> they're coming all over the place. <laughs> they're coming all over the uh, place. Yeah, pan. yeah. Okay. Puns let's, on pan. All right. Yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, but you can say that it is Pan, um, right. even though we don't know exactly what that... But whatever unearthly horror that's... Wh- whatever yeah, whatever unearthly it. horror that uh, Dr. Raymond has unleashed. Um, I'm open to either and or both. Um, but to be quite honest with you, it is the... Un- if you or, or we can go nebulous and say it is the unknown... It is the things outside of our perception that make us see things, that make us do things. It, there's any number of ways that we can uh, approach the antagonist the more I'm thinking about it. And it, honestly, any way you cut it, the uh, what Dr. Raymond put into uh, motion, um, the, the, the entity that he manifested mm. and the effects of the human psyche to like not be able to process what they're seeing. Cause that's mm-hmm. what happened to the little boy. Um, and this story, I'm going to say overall, I'm going to give the antagonist a one because it was just a very engaging mystery. Um, it, it's because it was like pretty nebulous throughout the story. It is kind of hard to say that there was, it, it's only a retrospect that you can actually see the, sure. uh, the, um, the antagonist, like so, you know, Doctor Raymond puts it in motion. Throughout this, there's this uh, psychosis, if you will. What did, what did they call the? What did they call the um, suicides? They said it was a uh, not a suicide plague, a uh, like a mass epidemic or something like that. Yeah, I know what you mean. A they, suicide yeah. epidemic. They, had to, they tried to like pin it down. And, like the papers are calling it or uh, whatever. Yeah, I think it was like uh, suicide or like uh, you know. It's not cholera or something. Suicide like that. mania. Yeah, I'm looking for it in a sec, but so I, I never, like, yeah, I it was mean. a mania of some sort. Yeah, but either way, um, you don't it, nothing. Suicidal really can, mania. Yeah, yeah, that's what suicidal it was. mania. <laughs> I just fucking love that. Um, but but it, nothing really comes into the focus at, at the end. So, um, throughout this, you are kind of left with this nebulous antagonist. You're not sure if it's the psychology of everything, if there is actually something manifesting. You don't know. But anyway, without it, there would be no story. Um, I found it very engaging. Um, and it, it, again, without the antagonist, there would be no story. And I'm really willing to say that Raymond and Pan and the human psyche, you can kind of, <laughs> All of those. Roll, roll into one. Yeah, I mean, because there really is no one clear-cut antagonist that we're following throughout this. Well, I mean, of course, I want to argue on piggyback on like in the type in this type of story, especially as he was like again sort of inventing, codifying the um, the specifics of it. It's fear and dread of the unknown. Now, whether that's through science, or whether it's through like you know some supernatural thing that is rooted in mythology, that somehow is actually like that does have some effect upon reality as we know it. But I think that's always going to be the case, and it's tied strongly in the themes as we just spoke about. But I think I do agree that if I call that mostly the antagonistic force, it's always going to be effective, and there's no exception here. Sure. So that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the existential horror from beyond the veil, you know, mm-hmm. from beyond the veil of human uh, perception, awareness, perception, or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I think that it is, if nothing else, which it is, it's oh, really well done in all facets. But if nothing else, it's Ever present antagonist. It's an ever present antagonistic force. Yes, well and yeah, like yeah, yeah. it is exactly. felt throughout this entire story so strongly, and I have to give it full credit, if just for that. Not to mention all of the other things that you guys mentioned about it. Uh, so I'm going to give it a one. Yeah, no, I think that's well stated, and I think it, what's why it deserves a one from all of us, or is at least getting a one. And uh, Siva, once you carry on with the protagonist. So it's yeah, it's it's a tough call, I guess. Kind of, I guess it's between Villers and Clark. I would uh, mostly Villers, I would say, especially towards like he because he is the bigger protagonist towards the end. I want to put it on him mostly. Mm. Uh, Although Clark has has his his place, you know what I mean. He opens. Yeah, technically, he's. You would think it's set up to see as if he were going to be the protagonist the whole time. But the mystery unfolds more through the eyes of Villers. Clark is just like a 
he gives him a couple clues throughout, but like, uh, I would say it's probably he's Villers. A sec, though, is what I'm. He's a, you know, but yeah, that's like uh, I think that's a really fascinating way to build a protagonist. Mm. And like, yeah. I love the fact that he's completely in the dark the entire time, just trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and like compelled to do so. Like, there's yeah, no reason point. why she. He's been <laughs> warned not to continue by yeah. somebody like, by like everyone that like feel yeah thread. exactly, yeah. and he's just he has to keep going, mm. and. You know, he doesn't make any big speeches about it. He just keeps doing it. He's like, I don't need... He basically, he's like, I don't even know why I'm doing this shit. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but some, you know, he's got to... He keeps stumbling upon different clues. Yeah. And, like, I think it's... I think he's really well done. He's a really intriguing person. Uh, and you kind of see him not... Going like he he's not going crazy. He's not like losing touch with reality through this, but like he's giving up more and more of his like safety as he goes. Like he's willing to give yeah, up more and more safety sure. as he goes through the through the story. And I really love that little aspect about it. As I was reading it, I was like, oh, this this is the, the way they're developing him is really good. Um, so I think I'm gonna give protagonist a one. Good, Chris. I really don't have any more to add to that. I'm, I agree with you. I'm giving him one. I mean, yeah, like, I'll cut it up, like, 60 Villers, 40% uh, Clark, because, mm. like I said, like they sort of, like, match and sort of slow rolls it, but because it's jumping for- back and forth between uh, time and space, if you will, yeah. a little bit. But, you know, I, I think they were both right around it enough. Villers, I, I think, yes, a bit more to the degree, a- as you mentioned. So I, I enjoyed them as protagonists, and, yeah, they the decisions they have made sense. They have an arc, for sure. They see something and learn something about maybe not themselves but the nature of reality mm-hmm. and maybe that trickles down to themselves but no i think they're they're well formed characters well fleshed out and their motivations and even like little like character quirks came through like you know per- personality quirks yeah so i think i will agree giving them a one uh, as a joint protagonist but lopsidedly so all right and that'll bring me i believe unless anything else to add because you're good with the one yep all right that'll bring me to secondary so a bit of a tricky one here I mean, should we count Helen slash Mary? Like, like, they're not protagonists. I don't think we just said. Right? I would say so. Maybe they're part of the monster, even like the antagonistic force, yeah. which rolls them out here. Then, then you, I guess you're left with Austin and like the the mem- the memories, the telling of the telling of the farmer, like you know, like mm. the stories from the stories that people like and the, the letters kid and stuff, like yeah. the boy and, and the son, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Helen's best friend Rachel when they were children. What happened to her? Like right. again, would you only get through like secondary exposition, anyways? So, like, I'm not sure if it's strong enough to, like, yes, they rounded out, like, you know, there's the Lord Argentina, whatever his name was, right? Like, one of the um, yeah visitors, guests at Ms. Beaumont's house, who Ms. Beaumont, spoiler, is Helen, and so forth. So, it's one of the threads, but they don't, he's not, like, there as a character so much. No, I mean, they just tell the story of yeah. him. So, like, you get a little bit, but. Killing I'm, himself. I'm leaning towards a zero just because they, they fill in the world, but they're not the most important part of it. Is I guess kind of my thought. Actually, I was gonna say that while they are not really truly developed as supporting characters, like you can't really point point to one and say, like we were doing with like in our review of Apocalypse Now, where everybody's got this Mm. character arc. But by the same token, the without the secondary characters to reflect what's going on, there would actually be no perspective of the story. That's it's this is I I know I know what you're saying. And but this is also in these I'm things saying, where saying the fine point because you because the supporting characters are the witnesses that basically um, Clark and um, Villers the, Villers uh, it's their stories that they're relating to one another like, and that kind of, yeah. it, so like they're not developed as characters so much I'd say the boy and his father are probably the most developed out of all of them. But uh, as I said, without Not very much though, is like right. Of but without them being witnesses, like if you look at it like a mystery, you know, you have these two detectives, for lack of a better term, <laughs> amateur sleuths. The amateur sleuths, sure. but but they're gathering all this information from these secondary characters. So my point is, it is one of these things where I'd probably be giving it more. It would be a point five if this were on a binary scale. Mm. But I kind of have to give credit for their function. Let's put it that way. So, so, so I'm you. giving it a one for that. Okay, go ahead, what, I'm still not convinced. So either way. all right. I mean, the, the the question is, you count 
Mary? Do you count Helen? Do you count Doc Raymond? I count Doc Raymond as a secondary character, yes. You know, do you count Austin? Austin's a pretty well-developed character. He's okay, sure. Um, if you count all those characters, I think you have to... I mean, I have to give supporting a one night. No one else has to, you don't I suppose. Have to, but, but you're saying you're. I think that going to. <laughs> I think that those characters are fairly well developed, and I think that Austin has an arc. Um, okay. Okay. I think that uh, Doc Raymond definitely has an arc. You know, from the beginning to the end. I mean, I know he only has like two real parts in this, but like true. But you see you, where he was. In yeah, yeah, yeah. You see exactly where he was and where he. Where his, you know, uh, pursuits have taken. Yeah, away. where, where, <laughs> yeah. you know, where his experience got him. Um, Mary is an interesting story because you are led, at least the way I read it was, I was led to believe that she was Helen, Mrs. Bochamp, right, like some, some uh, immortal, Bo- natural yeah. creature. Uh, yeah. yeah, the whole time, and then you find out that it's her daughter, right? Which I'm still don't understand. Uh, who was was Doctor Raymond the father supposed to be, or no, was it like it was the, so was it the Raymond? creature? Oh. Was oh, the that's true, like was yeah. Pan the father? I think father. it was very heavily implied to be Pan. Like, yeah, I guess the natural force somehow it got was her pregnant. Her smelling the bath salts or whatever. And, was yeah, yeah. Um, that. Uh, go ahead. I just thought of something though. But no, I mean, I, uh, that being said, I think that the supporting characters are pretty strong in this. Um, which I'm realizing now, I might get the, I might give this a ten. I don't know if it You're deserves quite that, it, but, but uh, yeah, I I think that the supporting characters are fairly strong in this. Uh, so I'm going to give it a one. I, I agree with you. I, I was going to give it a kind of a softer one, but you're right. If nothing else, Austin is definitely a, a well developed character. Uh, Austin, yeah, yeah, it's uh, Villar's friend that he talks yeah. to and then uh, like becomes friends with. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. gonna say he is he is fairly well developed. So yeah, I'm 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 solid in my one. All right, I like the point five thing because that's pretty much where I was. But I think you guys convinced me just enough to round it up for a one on secondary. Yeah. I should have saw something all you're speaking though. So maybe it ties back into themes. But the opening thing, the character's name is Mary, and you said like you know, it's a star role, but she gets immaculately like, impregnated, if right. you will, like by an, an unnatural force, it's, uh, like some other unworldly force. But and yeah, you know what? The only reason that I thought it might have been the doctor is because weird, like there's this weird moment right in the beginning before she, he puts her under. Where she's like, "Give me a kiss," and he's like, and then he kissed her on the yeah. lips. Yeah, and it was like just some weird shit. And I was like, mm, yeah, "What's going a bit on here?" Creepy there, but I think I mean, as you mentioned, I just put that together, and like maybe it should have been obvious, but there's a nice little touch there. Yeah, nice little like religious bent. Um, but yeah, so I, yeah, right. I'm gonna give that a one. Looks like one's around. All right, so then, Chris, why don't you tell us about the dialogue? The dialogue's really interesting because the dialogue's a lot of expository. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of exposition. It sure is. Um, and letters but, and stuff. It, it, and the, the the funny thing about the dialogue is it's like I said, it's it's a lot. It's pretty much all exposition. It is a it is a dialogue for pretty much, you know, between two guys um, recounting the stories and trying to put everything together. But at the same, t- so it's not like, I, so in a way, it's got my, it, it kind of meets my naturalistic. And I guess for the time, it was kind of natural dialogue. But I cannot yeah. get, I cannot get past the fact that I really felt like I was sitting in on a conversation and a conversation I was interested in. Um, so it might be a softer one, but it, but again, it is, I also, you also, and these things have to take into account the nature of, of when this was written, um, to a certain I degree. Suppose. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm again, here I am at a point five. So me too, again, as well. And this one, I think I'm leaning more towards rounding down. Now, again, nothing bad about it per se. And yes, it's natural enough given that it was like, they'll, the manner of speaking, assumingly around the time it was written, but you're right, Chris. Like at least I felt that more so than that, even that it was almost all exposition. Now, granted, you need some of this to get across the facts and set up a lot of the story itself and like what's going to happen. But a lot of it, like you said, is them sitting around like talking to each other, like, "Oh, I found this scrap of paper." Like it's not that it's not engaging, but I think it's the least engaging part of the story to me. Like, you want to sit by a fire in a big chair with, ha- with a brandy and listen to these guys talk about it. Yeah, I, Chris, that's almost exactly what I was just going to say. <laughs> like, I, I, 
really felt like a fly in the wall in this, but you guys are also right that it's like a lot of just exposition. At, but like it makes sense for the story that it is. Sure, but there's nothing like other than that about it. I guess is also one to Be- add on because the entire point of the story is like it's just a bunch of people getting together and telling each other what they found out. Mm. Like it's all it's all like after the fact. Like yeah. let's let's compare and try and figure out what's going sure. on. But this is you're right. This is a really tough one. I, I if I'm gonna give anything a zero, it's gonna be dialogue. And I think I'm in the same boat. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I. I you know what? I'm going to give it a zero because I think a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the uh, appeal of the dialogue is style for me. I it it doing, is like, yeah. I do feel like I, the should, same thing. I do feel like yeah. we should be like, I should be like sitting in a third like leather chair <laughs> with like a snifter of brandy, like listening, like sure. having a chat with these two guys. Like, and that's all down to the, the you know, the description of the place and and the setting and and instead of you know the dialogue is fine it gets you where you need to be but really but what that's it all is it's there for but really what it is is like the the descript the descriptive language is really where where it's at in this story yeah. so i'm going to give dialogue a zero because i you know what it's because i don't want to give this a 10 right. I I, think, i'll tell you that right now i'll I be honest it, i think just to, just to sort of like <laughs> justify it that i think like i said it's the weakest part of the story yeah relatively so i think you're more than justified giving it a zero which is what i think i'm going to do have yeah. you decided yeah i'm going to give it a zero yes. because okay. this was if there was one thing i was going to give a zero yeah. to it was going to be this again i think final thought on this all we all agree like it's not bad per se but it, it basically is a vehicle to get you the facts of the story right and i think the next question speaking of that speaking of style steve-o i think a lot of it goes to that instead of actual dialogue yeah, the style is fantastic. It's it really put me in the mind of like um well, I think I said this outside. It was like a it's it's like a mix between uh Edgar Allan Poe and Lovecraft mm-hmm. and like it just made me feel like I was in this really period like of the time uh story Without, you know, obviously because it was of that time, without trying to be a period piece, right? Like, sure. I've seen things that try to, like, mimic this style, I guess. Uh, and it never works out quite as well. Like, this is just, like... It's often hard to do that. Perfectly, yeah, sure. like, perfectly of its time and then perfectly, like, out of its time and place. Like, just so at parts so like otherworldly and really the the descriptions are brilliant just things that you know would be difficult to think of were i the one writing this i <laughs> sure, I, I feel sure. like the, i get what you mean i feel like the descriptions of uh, of this like really surreal stuff are really really well done and um and helped along by just the descriptions of the regular world uh, like the London streets and so yeah, yeah, are such a good um, counterpoint to each other, and I'm going to give it very full credit for style. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add. I, I do enjoy style quite a bit. Um, when we encountered his the first story we did of, from Arthur Matchins, like I actually might like this one a little bit better than that one. But yeah, certainly it's it can be hypnotic. I think like that's the kind of thing that draws you in. Like mm. his choice of language, like. And yes, while one may say that was advocate style that he sometimes overuses things here and there, I think it all, it does flow together very nicely for the most part overall, way more often than it doesn't. And whatever points I took away from narrative are because of that. Yeah. Pretty much. But yeah, I think he's very nice. You get into it, sort of draws you in in the way the characters feel drawn into their little mystery. So I'm probably going to give it a one. The only thing I have to add steve is i'd go with the crushed velvet as opposed to leather <laughs> um but no i agree with you i i this is one of those stories where you really do kind of want to wrap you can kind of wrap yourself around into it and it's yeah. I, I loved the style of the story i am a fan of lovecraft um it's been a while this is proto lovecraft so it's yeah. been but no what i'm saying is i i love anything it, like it Ed. right because we're i got tripped up at heart of darkness because that was a a, a late 18th century 
style that I could not get into. This is the style that's definitely in my wheelhouse. And it, like I said, it, it does. It's been a long time since I read Frankenstein, but it does have elements of Shelley in it. It does have elements of Poe in it. It does obviously, you know, influence Lovecraft. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely given this a very, very strong one. Yeah, I agree. I think style is one of the strongest points, and we've all agreed on ones there. So to bring me home to recommendation, technically yes. Now I've never again was never familiar with this story, but we wanted one in the vein of white people, and and while we while trying to do that, I found this one by the same author, and again his fans and like amongst those who are uh, st- studying him, if you are like in, into it, like this is one of the best. It's like oh, if, this is a good introduction to him. Even, yeah. even again beyond uh, the previous one. So yes, I would recommend the Great God Pan. I think it's quite a solid read. Now, Chris and I admit, like, probably a little bit more degree than you, Steve-O, that we're into this kind of stuff just in general as a genre. But it, inter- it can be interesting to see where it came from, and again versus some of the other contemporary literature of its time. But yeah, I do recommend it quite a bit, and I enjoyed uh, reading it throughout. This film, this film, right? This story definitely warrants a second read once you get past it. And because you're never, I was never really sure where the hell we were with regard to time. Um, I mean, it was, and, it's and, all chronological. Yeah. But the thing is, it's, it, it's, to me, it didn't gel until the end. Mm, okay. And my whole point is, if I get to the end and I'm like, I want to reread it knowing what I know now, that to me, sure, it's pretty. It, yeah, it's 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 a re- yeah. it's a, the same kind of recommendation you do. Yep. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend it. I think it's a I, I loved it. I thought it was a great story. Yeah, I mean, I'll give it full a full recommendation. All right. Um, I am blown away that the first time I ever heard of this guy was the white people. I've read that and this story, and I I can't believe he's not a bigger deal. Uh, I'm I'm actually really surprised that he's not like on a level with Lovecraft and Poe. I don't know what else he's written. Maybe those are the only two good things he's ever written, there and that's why. But like, like yeah. I, uh, uh, if if that's not the game, I mean, if all of his stuff is this good, I don't understand why he's not up there with some of the greats. I kind of get what you mean. Um, I actually might get a collection of his, like after now having to talk this out. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm an asshole because you've all definitely recommended white people. I've yet to read it, and I will read it right after this because I'm reading this. I'm like, oh shit, I totally forgot about that. You, yeah. when when Scott posted this story, he put up on Slack, and he, he did give the explanation uh, about why he chose this. Um, and you know, I it. I agree with you guys. It's got me hungry to read more from this author. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. that's a pretty resounding uh, recommendation. Check it out and check uh, check mention out. Yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff. It, all right, so let's let's uh, do the final tallies here. Uh, Chris has given it a oh sorry, Steve. Oh no, you have given it a nine. Chris and I have given it an eight. For the most part, uh, we deducted a little bit of points on uh, on plot. Just a little like you know little nitpicks here and there, but yeah. enough for two of us. And we all agree that dialogue was the weakest part. So. Lost little points on there, but overall, that leaves us with a 8.3, which is still fairly strong. Yeah. And yeah, Arthur Machen, uh, very interesting read. Like you said, kind of weird that he isn't known as much, even like w- even within the sphere, but people who do know him seem to point to this one as one of the best, and I think it is a very good introduction if you're jo- going to get into him. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think that'll do it for The Great God Pan. I've been here with my, uh, again, uh, paganistic uh, helpers, <laughs> Chris Morgan. Have a good night. And Steve Ramosi. The great God Steve. And we'll see you next time <laughs> in the great beyond. Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Manser. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows and on Facebook and Twitter for updates.